When we're thinking of doing intensive psychotherapy, we're looking at a complex picture. It's a person who could have depression or anxiety or psychosomatic problems or sexual problems or sleep problems or any number of kinds of problems, but they're usually chronic. They don't go away easily. They're usually based on psychological conflict. So the person is torn in two different ways. You want something badly, like a relationship, but every time you start to get close, you just totally panic and are fearful. So the person has a conflict, and it's usually a conflict that's caused by something that went awry in development. So we're not machines, you know, we're not hardware and software, and it's not a matter of just changing the software and thinking differently. We, we grow and we develop. We're more like plants than we are like machines. And in the course of our development, sometimes things go awry. Development can be blocked. Certain capacities don't develop. There can be trauma, which is the commonest thing we see um, in patients who need intensive psychotherapy. And they tend, when we've studied them here in Ontario and throughout the world, to be people who have multiple psychiatric disorders. If you're just doing that checklist, they're depressed, they're anxious, they often have somatic complaints, bodily complaints, sleep problems, sexual problems, and also personality issues, problems relating in certain kinds of situations. So that's really typical. And it's a class of people whose problems won't get better with less intensive interventions. Or if they had less intensive interventions, it just prolongs the pain and doesn't resolve it. Or perhaps gives them a temporary relief. So when we look at the kinds of people in Ontario, for instance, who've been in intensive psychotherapy, the psychoanalytic psychotherapies, the interpersonal kinds of psychotherapies, what we find is 82% of them have already tried less intensive forms of therapy. And one way to think about it is this. Like, do you need a shorter term intervention or a longer term or a more intensive intervention? If you've had a pretty good baseline up here throughout your life, and then some event happens, some, you know, a death or some major disappointment, something didn't materialize, and your baseline functioning goes down here, often with a short number of sessions, we can get a person back up here. But there are many, many people who've never been up here. They've had a sector of their personal functioning that's down here. And those things aren't changed with a handful of sessions. And often what we find when we look at it is there was something that didn't happen in development. And so one of the things that's happening in these intensive forms of psychotherapy is we're sort of getting to the bottom of where development went awry and we help it resume. And then when it resumes, what you find is people can sometimes not only go up to a good baseline, sometimes they can go beyond what they dreamed possible for themselves. Now, this is a therapy that understands something really, really important about human beings, that we really are all different. We've all had different histories. And so it's not a therapy that goes by a manual and says, if the patient says this, you say that. If patients were machines, that would work every time, perhaps. But they're not. And so because everybody's different, what the intensive psychotherapist does is they ask a lot of open-ended questions. And they don't immediately assume they know what's best for the patient. What we do is we look for the blocks. We look for the ways they get in their own way. We look for where their insight starts to break down. We point it out to them. We help them to see it. And this always has to happen in the context of earned trust. You have to take time with the patient to earn their trust. Um, and that doesn't happen overnight. And it actually, it doesn't happen in a couple of sessions either, even if you're really, really good. When people's development have gone awry, they're really sensitive to um, being misunderstood by others. So as the trust is earned, what you find is the person starts to spontaneously feel that they can, with you there, look into the aspects of themselves they don't understand. And that's really, really important. You know, um, when people come to treatment, they often say, how does talking help? And 
it's not just talking. It's talking with someone who's listening, who's been trained to listen for these kinds of blocks. People like to make a lot of jokes about therapists just listening. But actually, if you ask Canadians what bothers them most about their experience with healthcare providers, they'll say, we don't have enough psychotherapeutic counseling. We don't have people who are listening. Everybody's rushed on to the next thing. Now, if you think everybody's the same or everyone with depression is the same, why listen? You hear the symptoms, you think about the medication or the treatment, and, and you give it to the person, you send them off, or you tell them how their thinking is all messed up. But if you don't think that everybody's the same, each encounter with a patient is, is, is very, very different. You know, the kinds of people in therapy that I've treated over the years, it's a full spectrum. Some of the stories um, are so awful you just can't sleep at night. Some of the stories, yes, they don't sound that awful, but when you sort of look into the patient's conundrum, you realize they're really stuck for a good reason. Look, over the years, I've dealt with people who have um, been forced to have sex with their mother, their father, a sibling. I've developed a kind of expertise in dealing with patients who had very good parents, but they lost them. Their parents died when they were very, very young. I've had people discover siblings who had committed suicide. I've had people sent away for various reasons, sometimes because of war, sometimes because of illness, from parents you know, at, at an age when people need their parents the most. I've had patients who've been viciously beaten by parents or caregivers, people who've been kidnapped, uh, people who've had terrible disabling accidents. But you know, there are a lot of people who suffer terribly who haven't had these dramatic traumas that are easy to describe, and suffering is suffering. And they're very, very blocked. You know, lovely people who, for instance, had subtle learning disorders growing up. And they're always this close to accomplishing their goals and never can. And they don't even know it's because of a learning disorder. And when you, you start to figure that out, sometimes we can send them for interventions for the learning disorder. But having had a childhood learning disorder that wasn't, wasn't known, which is very, very common, by the way, it can be very traumatic. You can be tra traumatized by your own brain. I've treated you know, patients who've had psychosis and bipolar illness over the years. And people would say, well, isn't that a chemical imbalance? And there is a chemical imbalance in those. But it's traumatic to basically not be able to discern what's real and what isn't real. That's really traumatic. This idea that if a person is either schizophrenic or bipolar or, or something like that, that they don't deserve psychotherapy, they just require medication, it's absurd. When, particularly when the medications are somewhat helpful, they can really use the psychotherapy. And then there are people who have what's often demeaned as neurosis. So here's what a neurosis is. A neurosis is a situation where you're going in two directions at once. Your reason tells you that it's actually safer to take an airplane than it is to go in a car, but you're much, much more worried about the airplane. Or you swear you're not going to provoke your boss, it's the day before he's deciding your raise. And every time that comes up, you go in there and you're, you're very annoying. We can all chuckle about that, but some people's lives are ruined by these kinds of things. Or there's someone you love and cherish and feel the most tender feelings about, but you can't have any sexual excitement with that person. So all of those things are in the class of things that are called neurosis. And we like to make fun of them. You know, maybe that's the worried well. Except if it's you, it, it destroys your potential perhaps for a marriage or, or for success at work. So psychotherapy can also deal with those kinds of conditions. And they're really, really common. And they're really, really important to deal with. You know, there's another misconception out there. We should look at the treatments and see which treatments cure people and which don't and not use uh, the ones that don't. That makes sense, right? Except nowhere else in medicine do we talk like that. Here's what I mean by that. You know, in medicine, what we've learned over the years is that um, we can cure sometimes. We try to relieve often. 
and we comfort always. And there are certain people with mental illnesses that are really, really severe. And if we're honest, we're not curing them. But psychotherapy, it's called supportive psychotherapy, can be the thing between a schizophrenic person or someone who has an illness like that, who's had just a life you couldn't even begin to imagine. It's, it's been so bad. And they've lost the genetic lottery. Those people need someone to talk to. Sometimes that psychotherapy, supportive psychotherapy, goes on a long time. But it's a very, very humane undertaking. And it's always been a medical kind of undertaking. Medicine is understood. At times, we comfort people. And sometimes that psychotherapy, these people have no one in their lives, is keeping that person from killing themselves or just from a life of desperate isolation in a total abyss. You know, people who don't understand psychotherapy like to say it's talk ther therapy, which it is, and that it's just talk. But we've been doing psychotherapy for about 100 years now, and it's not just any old talk. Um, and actually, when it's done properly, we now have studies, we have brain scan studies that show that it actually changes the wiring of the brain. And that includes psychoanalytic psychotherapy. That's a study by uh, Buchheim that was done where people had tried previous forms of treatment, didn't get better, and then they were given intensive psychotherapy. Their brains were scanned before and after. And when they had this intensive psychoanalytic psychotherapy, as they got better, their brain scans normalized. And we know the parts of the brain that was firing abnormally at first, and we know how it normalized. And in recent years, there's just been this incredible breakthrough, this discovery that the brain is neuroplastic. So neuros for neuron, the nerve cells in the brain, and plastic means changeable or modifiable or adaptable. And neuroplasticity is that property of the brain that allows it to change its structure and its function in response to mental experience. So that's thinking, imagining, perceiving, reflecting on yourself. All of those things, um, when done properly in a professional way, can actually change the structure and function of the brain in a positive direction. And this is actually one of the ways that psychotherapy works. So psychotherapy is working at a biological level. It's affecting biological systems. It's affecting chemicals. We know this also from you know, millennia of meditation when we study meditators. They change their brain wiring, and they also can change uh, the chemical bath in which the, the brain is bathed. So psychotherapy not only clearly intervenes at a biological level, um, it can do so in a positive way. And in some ways, it does it in a way that's um, with higher resolution than medications do. So look, I recommend medications for some patients, but not all patients, and you know, as much as is necessary and no more, and sometimes they are not necessary. Uh, the over-reliance on medication, I think it, every sensible person knows can be a problem because when medications enter your body, they bathe your entire body and they bathe your entire brain. So even though the target of the medication may be one small part of your brain, when you take that medication for your issue, you get all sorts of other effects. They're called side effects, um, but they're really just the, the medication doing what it does to parts of the brain that we don't want, we don't want to influence. So I don't actually think they're side effects. They're actually just effects. So medication, thank God, we have it for some conditions. But using it when we shouldn't, that's a problem. So psychotherapy, particularly when we're dealing with trauma, what we can do is we can literally get the person to think about the trigger for their trauma. And that activates those brain circuits involved in that trauma. And then while they're activated, if we've created a safe environment for the patient, which is a lot of what we do as psychotherapists, they can actually rewire it. One of the things that happens in trauma is this. You're in the midst of a terrible, terrible attack. And perhaps you think you're going to be killed, murdered. And you might stare up at the ceiling tiles. And what your brain does is at a certain point, it's when it literally cannot cope with that, it fractures consciousness and it stops the perceptions from cohering for, and you knowing the meaning of it. That man, his, you know, his um, raspy beard, the fact that I'm being pinned down, the knife that I'm seeing, all means he's probably going to try to slit my throat. So 
it's probably a protective thing for you know when animals are about to be eaten by predators. They go into what's called a dissociated state. Now the parallel or of the dissociated state in the brain is we stop putting our perceptions together so that we understand their meaning. And so the person who's traumatized now, um, after the trauma's over, if they're lucky enough to survive, never took that event, though the, which they, their brain knew as perceptions, if you will, and put them into a memory, because the, the brain kind of froze in the midst of the trauma. So what they do is, if there's anything that is similar to the event, let's say there, is a, there was a knife involved, and then they see a knife at a restaurant with, you know, a, a chef is chopping something, they could be re-triggered, or if there was a loud noise involved in a war, and then a car backfires. So what happens is those perceptions, which were never filed away as memory, are reactivated, and they reactivate your, th your stress center, and it's like it's happening all over again. In fact, that's not the way to put it. It's just happening, because there's no sense of the past. And what we do with these new trauma psychotherapies, which are great, they're one of the greatest breakthroughs in modern medicine, as far as I'm concerned, is we learn how to put a person in a particular state where they can trigger that memory and very, very quickly, in using different techniques that make them feel safe, allow them to desensitize, and so on, they can actually file them away as memories. And the patients always say the same thing when you work all of that through. That's a, a term Freud used, working through. They say, I don't feel like it's happening now. I feel it's over. I can move on. It's like it was a really bad thing. I feel really badly for myself as that child who experienced that. But it's actually over. Now, in many, many ways in psychotherapy when we're working with trauma, and I'm talking about it a lot because that's one of my specialties, is we do that over and over in many ways. We help people turn the page and experience bad things that happened as something that's over and now you can actually think about it because once it's a memory and you're not re-perceiving it, you've got all of your capacities to use to bring to bear on it. So a lot of traumas can be healed. And by the way, can every trauma be healed? That's just extrapolation. I, I don't know. I mean, some things can be so bad. Life can be so hard that not always the case. But sometimes we're surprised at things we thought couldn't be helped and they can be helped. So it's always worth the effort. Canadians made a covenant. When doctors were asked to join the public system, the promise was um, that we are going to ensure everybody for es established treatments, of which psychotherapy is one of the most established treatments that we have. And that would enable um, all levels of society to sign on to this. And it would, of course, make it available for people who were of average income or less. In fact, when we look at who's in psychotherapy, they basically make an average income in Ontario, which is exactly what you would expect if it was distributed you know, just according to medical need. And, but it's, it's not cheap because it's intensive. Like most medical treatments where a person has a chronic illness, most middle class people would be completely wiped out if they had to pay for their chronic care. You know, we have taxes in Canada and to support these things, and people have paid their tax dollars for these things. And interestingly, when we look at the psychotherapy that's done in Ontario, what we find is that it's not overprescribed at all. Um, and the people who are in it need it, and they're coming back because, in general, they're feeling they're benefiting. People often say, you know, psychotherapy, that's for the worried well, you know, it's for... Um, people from Hollywood are, you know, blabbing away about trivialities. And it's for the rich. And, well, if the government cuts out intensive psychotherapy, it will be for the rich.